I'm joined this afternoon by my friend and colleague, Jeremy Edelman, who's a professor of history at Princeton. And Jeremy has been teaching capitalism using a global frame for a number of years. And I thought I'd begin by asking him his views, his thoughts on why in the last decade there's been a remarkable resurgence of scholarly and popular interest in the history of capitalism. Jeremy. Thanks, Rick. It's, it's great to be back in, in the classroom seminar with you again after many years. Um, so yes, why, why capitalism? Why now? Why the resurgence? Um, I mean, one of the storylines here is, in some sense, why did it die away? Uh, you know, when you and I were students, uh, we won't give it away to the students when that was, but there, there was a big debate. There were a number of big debates around capitalism. And then sometime in the 90s and the aughts, it, it, it sort of faded from view for, uh, for various reasons we, we, we can go into if you're interested, um, but it came back to light uh, most clearly in North America around 2008. But one of the things that, that I was seeing, since I was spending a lot of time in Latin America, is that the capitalism debates and controversies were much more alive outside North America and Western Europe than they were inside. So in some senses, let's say crises and problems that societies in Eastern Europe, Latin America, um, uh, South Asia, and, and of course in Africa and elsewhere were experiencing were now getting reintroduced into uh, Western European and North American say, intellectual landscape. So, um, so it's, it's, it's the resurgence um, after 2008 is, was in part the recognition that there was something global happening and that there were these debates happening elsewhere. And I, and I think they're clearly the crisis of 2008 um, was, a, was an important spark, but there were other things coming. Um, I'd love to know your thoughts on this, but I think the concern about, as far as, as, as I was following this and we've been in this field, the concern that there is something that connects the economic model to concerns about what have been conventionally defined as outside the economy. And I think that's clearest when it comes to the way resources are used and particularly fossil fuels. And so the concern about climate change increasingly couldn't be separated from the economic model. So even without a financial crisis in 2008, I think there were a series of dynamics that people were starting to connect up and to see that, um, you know, that, that, that what we call capitalism is a bundle of, I mean, probably get into this, um, and I'm sure the students will be kicking it around with you all semester long, um, that it's about a bundle of relationships between things that were previously compartmentalized by disciplines. So this belongs to economics. This belongs to, so, well, the problems of the contemporary age really blur some of those boundaries. So I'd say 2008 was important in kind of lighting a spark around these, around finance, inequality, um, economic injustices, but it was coming from a variety of directions beforehand. I think, I think that's really spot on. I, I would add one other dimension that sort of complements what you've said, and that's really the rise of China as a, a major world power. Yeah. Because I think um, as more people became aware of the dynamism of the Chinese economy, they on the one hand um, understood this as in a very real sense, a command economy where you could move resources, be they people um, mm -hmm. or material uh, around in a way that was simply not possible right. um, in the capitalist West. But perhaps equally as important was the problematic relationship between capitalism and market economies and democracy, political freedoms. And um, I think it was a sobering reality for many people, particularly um, those who had identified uh, with the liberal tradition mm -hmm. to understand that the spread of market relations did not inevitably mean um, an extension of the democratic realm. 
It could yeah, so quite so. comfortably go hand in hand uh, with things like internet censorship, uh, persecution mm -hmm. of minorities, um, et cetera. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. I think you know the the, the question around China reminds us that as long as we could tell ourselves a story that China would at least economically, if not the rest, and it comes to the question of democracy, um, look increasingly like the West, um, then it was not a problematic. Um, and the entry into the WTO, um, China being part of the global supply chain matrix that was enveloping the planet, um, was treated in a kind of, as a euphoric, almost triumph of Western capitalism itself, that it could finally convert China. The thing that we'd been trying to do for 250 years, uh, because in the late 18th century, the Macaulay expedition goes to try to negotiate a trade agreement so that the British could trade with, uh, with China, got repudiated. Finally, um, th this long saga has ended uh, with a process of integration only to discover that China did not look like us. As you say, it had different sets of legal and political coordinates, uh, a different legal regime. Um, and, uh, and that raised questions about which model, uh, that, that the capitalist structure that we assumed was a superior uh, uh, began to reveal some of its, it, it, its shortfallings while it didn't necessarily create a romance around China, except it may be a very brief one, um, what it did was change the game because suddenly China, the, the country that we admitted into the world economy was a, becoming a competitor. Uh, and so the global and the anti-global spirit that came with 2015, 2016 was also a response to the China question. And I think you're right. It, it, it then morphs into the illiberal forms in which capitalism can take. And there was an old precept that goes back to the 19th century that the spread of markets will create, um, will, will spread other institutional forms, including liberal democracy. And that necessary linkage got broken. So let me bounce another idea off of you um, that I think helps explain renewed interest in capitalism beyond the academy. So as students in this class uh, will learn over the next few weeks, there's nothing new about globalization. In fact, uh, next week, we're gonna be looking at the long distance trading routes that tied the world together uh, in the 16th and even the 15th uh, centuries. There've been waves of um, globalization. But I think in the early 2000s, um, for the first time, there was widespread awareness that the new global economy with um, the ability to move vast amounts of capital with a few keystrokes and the rise of new institutions of global governance had also brought into being new problems. And we began to see waves of protest against um, sort of free market neoliberal right. uh, globalization. Um, I think it was just a few months before 9-11 uh, that there were the first violent confrontations between uh, protesters and authorities. And I can't recall whether it was a, a G7 gathering uh, or, or what. There had been one in Genoa and then one in, in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, given the fact that um, the Cold War is now clearly part of history and, and behind mm -hmm. us, um, there was a new willingness to re-examine the, the trajectory of capitalism without being encumbered by the baggage of the Cold War and the baggage of um, you know, the first world and the second world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think um, the, the story of, of globalization, um, I, I think a couple of things have happened. I mean, one is that for some time, and I th think this is maybe what you're getting at, there was a thought that um, or at least this was in the narrative of the advocates of globalization or say the flat world storytelling. We're thinking of Thomas Friedman and others. Um, but this was something altogether new, 
right? With new technologies, um, new models of interdependency, a new kind of accelerated form of social life um, was completely new. And I think uh, with that was the thought that, and it's very characteristic of a kind of American style, right? Which is we can erase, clear the slate and, and, and start things over um, only to learn, as you're saying, that, that there have been um, alternative forms, previous forms, and polycentric forms of capitalism. So alternative, because it turns out that other societies, and lo and behold, China is another form of what we call models of capitalism. There isn't just one ideal type, which is about free markets. Um, and so the flat earth uh, uh, the flat world, a story about globalization creating greater economic homogenization around markets wasn't really working and was never really there, that there was a lot of variety. The other was it was deeper. And as you say, I mean, one might say that capitalism has been around, although at, here, and maybe we can discuss this, there's a difference between market integration and capitalist integration that there were processes of market relations, and this is the Silk Road, was that capitalism, or to what extent was that capitalism, I think is something that we ought to be thinking about. Um, and there might be a debate, was that capitalism or was that market interaction that laid the seeds for or created conditions for what would later be something called capitalism? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you mentioned that because as the students will see next week and the week after, we're going to be looking pretty closely at the role of merchant capital, both yeah. in tying parts of the world together, but also in laying the groundwork for the emergence of capitalism. That's right. And one of the things that we'll be looking at is the notion of embedded capitalist. That's right. Capitalists. The way in which um, these are prefigurative but are constrained often by, by states and by governments, um, where commerce is really um, kept at bay and the agrarian sectors um, receive uh, the blessings of, of the right. state. But Jeremy, let me, let me go back to something you mentioned right at the beginning um, and ask you to take a stab at explaining why the study of capitalism goes quiet um, in the late 80s, the 90s, and uh, the early part of this century. Because we, in, in, we did begin this session by talking about this extraordinary resurgence um, in around 2007, 2008, but yeah. why the silence before that? Well, I, I, I think uh, my own view is, is it's related to a point that you had made earlier, which is, a combination of, of the end of the Cold War. And so the deep sixing of the, one might say the existential threat to liberal capitalism, which was socialism. And once socialism wasn't seen as a viable threat, even in the minds of the Cold Warriors who felt both confident in their own beliefs and commitments to capitalism and yet anxious enough to justify the mobilization of very high amounts of resources to wage a war against uh, against uh, socialism or the idea of a global socialist threat. So, with that gone, um, what to what to be concerned uh, about? And in that gap, of course, and here I'll bring the kind of Latin American, East European, developing world also perspective on this was the dismantling of the developmental alternatives um, in India, parts of Latin America and elsewhere. So it's not just socialist, it was this idea that you could construct a different model of development that could have its own characteristics, but wouldn't necessarily look like the one that was being advocated out of precincts like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Um, those alternatives died as well, and there were various euphemisms to describe them, the Washington Consensus, uh, the word neoliberalism began to catch greater uh, attention in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And I mean, just to remind the students that even the word globalization itself um, 
is claimed, and here's a kind of minor correction, is claimed to have been invented by a Harvard Business School, um, well, so the Harvard Business Review piece, I believe 87 or 88, and it gains traction in the early 90s. In fact, it was a term coined by a commission in 1980 called North-South, which was this global commission to look at the problems of global poverty and the arms race. And they use the term globalization to mean a very different kind of global moral economy than ironically the one which celebrated the spread of the global market economy. So for a good 10, 15 years, uh, when you and I were starting out our careers, I, let's just say the second version, that story about the spread of the market economy suppressed the alternative narratives around the global moral economy. And I think what we're seeing, what we've been seeing the last 10 years or so is a resurgence, not coming out of necessarily a global socialist alternative, although there are socialist currents that are coming back to life, but a deep, deep disenchantment with the euphoria um, and, and, and the, the false promises that were made in the name of this global market economy. 